We're going to be talking about the Feast of the Lord, the Holy Moedim. Who can tell me what Moedim mean? Feast of Appointed <laughs> times, that's right. And in Leviticus 23, he says, these are my appointed times. These are my holy days. He doesn't say, these are the holy days of the Jews. He doesn't say, these are the holy days of Israel. Mm -hmm. He says, these are my holy days. Observe them. So if we want to connect ourselves to Hashem, we will get on Hashem's calendar. Amen? Amen. And so it's a privilege ever so often to go back over Leviticus 23 and talk about not only the timing of the holy days, but also what they foreshadow because they're prophetic. So if you will turn with me in your Bibles to Leviticus chapter 22, let's start at the end of 22. And all around the world today, in all the synagogues, do you know that they're reading the same passage? From verse 26 of chapter 22 down through 36 of the next chapter. It says, Adonai said to Moshe, When a bull, sheep, or goat is born, it is to stay with the mother for seven days. Now what's interesting about this is that God throughout the ages has given prophetic pictures of all different kinds of people using different kinds of animals. So even in the sacrifices, and we can see this in Enoch, like we talked about the book of Enoch this morning, chapter 88, God gives a vision of all of these amazing lineages down through Abraham and down through even our day. And he gives different types of animals to, depending on how their characters would be exemplified. If you're clean and holy and following God's ways, you're like a sheep, or you might be a ram or a goat or um, a lamb. But if you're unclean, if you choose to live in rebellion, like Esau got a different kind of animal described for him, like a wolf, or Ishmael, like a donkey, you know, you see these different things. This is what Peter was meditating on. He loved the book of Enoch when God gave him a vision of go to the Gentiles, who you're looking at as unclean. He likened them unto unclean animals. He wasn't telling Peter to eat unclean meats. This was in direct correlation with his meditations on the book of Enoch. So in these sacrifices, we find that a bull atones for the sins of the high priest because the high priest is atoning for the sins of not only Israel, but praying for all the nations. The blessings of all the nations were dependent on the high priest in Israel. So a bull represents not only the high priest, but also all the nations. That's why on Sukkot, during this week, do you know on the first day, if we had a temple, we would be sacrificing 13 bulls. And then on the second day of Sukkot, we would sacrifice 11, uh, 12 bulls, and then 11 and 10. For seven days, we do this. And if you add that all up, 13 plus 12 plus 11 plus 10 plus 9 plus 8, for those seven days, you would come to 70 bulls that were sacrificed, one for each of the nations that came out of Babylon. From when the languages were confused at the Tower of Babel, there were 70 different languages, and out of that, 70 core nations arose. So you can even see the symbolism here, talking about whether it's a bull for the nations, or a sheep for Israel, or a goat is born, it's to stay with its mother for seven days. First Peter says, a day is like a thousand years to the Lord. It's showing that we are to stay here on this earth, dealing with the sin of this earth, for 7,000 years. But what happens? But, from the eighth day on, it may be accepted as an offering to the Lord. Here we're going to be accepted in the presence of the Lord after 7,000 years, after that last seventh millennial day, we can then be in the presence of the Almighty God reflecting His pure light, just like the moon reflects the light of the sun. And we're going to correlate the heavenly bodies with the timing of God's Moedims this morning as well. So you can even see in this very first verse, this prophetic significance of the whole plan of salvation from creation down through 7,000 years, and then Mashiach comes, and that final 1,000 years, and then in the eighth day when we are accepted. Verse 28, However, no animal is to be slaughtered together with its young on the same day neither cow nor you. This is to respect and honor the principle of life and the life giver, the mother and the young. When you offer a sacrifice of thanksgiving to Adonai, you must do it in such a way that you will be accepted. It must be eaten on the same day it is offered. Leave none of it till morning. 
I am Adonai. And we see the same principle with Pesach. Remember the lamb that was um, slain on the 14th day of Nisan? It had to be eaten that night before sunup, before dawn. It says in verse 31, you are to keep my mitzvot. Now what word is this word keep here? We have two words to keep any holy day holy. In the fourth commandment, God says, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy, right? Six days you shall labor and do all of your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord thy God. That word is zachor at Yom HaShabbat. Zachor means to remember it, as if God knew that people, Israel, dispersed amongst the nations in the last days, would forget the very first of his Moedim, which is the weekly Sabbath. So he says, remember it, zachor. But here, and in Exodus 31, he gives a slight twist on this. He says, Shamor. So now instead of Zachor, when it says you are to keep my mitzvot, it means to guard them. Shamor means to protect them, like a husband would protect a wife. And you would tend to it like a, a gardener would tend to a garden. Shamor has all of this connotated in it. So if we are to guard his commandments and obey them, it's not just simply obeying them, but how do we guard them? We teach people how to observe them. We, we create little fences to make sure not even to get close to breaking them. This is why we start Shabbat a little bit early on the end of the on the end of the sixth day so we don't light a fire when we're lighting the candles after dark. These are all little ways to guard his mitzvot. He says, I am yod heh vav -He. You are not to profane my holy name. This yod heh vav -He, it's a holy name. Anything that's used in regular verbiage becomes common. And the definition of holy from the Hebrew, kodesh, means to set apart. If something's set apart, then it's set apart for only holy use. It's not used all the time. So right after him telling us to guard his commandments and obey them, he's telling us to also guard and protect his holy name. He says, I am to be regarded as holy among the people of Israel. This is what gives us that holy awe, that infatuation, that we fall in love with the lover of our souls. I am Yahava. And do you know when you say the yod heh vav -Heh without adding any vowel points to it? What's amazing is you hear three Hebrew words come out of that. When you say Yahava, the yod heh vav -Heh, Av is father. Hava is self-existent one, and Ahava is love. So you're literally hearing in Hebrew, self-existent father of love. His name is a depiction of his very character, his very nature of a loving God. And so this is so holy that we only use it in special uh, times like blessing the children. He says, I am yod heh vav -Heh, who makes you holy. So if he's holy, he says, be ye holy even as I am holy in Leviticus. And then he reminds us, I brought you out of the land of Egypt to be your God. This is intimate marriage language. It's like to be your man. I brought you out like a slave girl. I redeemed you and I want to be your God, not only God, but I want to be your husband. I am Adonai. That's what leads up to chapter 23 that we're all so familiar with, with the holy days. Adonai then said to Moshe, tell the people of Israel, these are the Moedim, the appointed times of Adonai, which you are to proclaim as holy convocations. These are my times. So we observe them in, in honor and respect to him, not because they're man-made, not because they're traditional, not because they're part of any culture or nation or religion. That's right, these are his holy times. And this is what the world needs to recognize. In following God's ways, they will be blessed. There's blessings in here, not only of prosperity and health and wellness, but you get insight into the future. When you understand God's holy days, he's actually telling you what is to come. And what we're gonna find out is the spring feast we're pointing to Yeshua coming as the prophet like unto Moshe, fulfilling that prophecy. He was humble and meek and a suffering servant of Isaiah 53. The fall feast in which we're in this period all point to him returning as Mashiach and king and high priest, returning the exiles of Israel from all over the earth, rebuilding the tabernacle in Jerusalem and reigning there. And so we're gonna look prophetically at these holy days this morning. 
he starts off introducing the seventh day Shabbat as one of his appointed times. And as we set apart these holy times, this is what makes us holy. We become set apart. You can't expect to be a holy people, a set apart people, if you don't observe his set apart times. Work is to be done on six days, but the seventh day, which is a very specific day, it's not just any day can be a holy day. This is the seventh day, reiterated from the fourth commandment. It is a Shabbat Shabbaton. It's interesting, here it's introduced as a Shabbat of complete rest. A holy convocation. You are not to do any kind of work on it. It is a Shabbat for who? To the Lord. To the Lord. It's His Shabbat. So observe it out of respect for Him. It reminds you of creation. It also looks forward to the millennial Shabbat, the seventh millennial day. So it's ba both past and present. And he says, also, it will remind us of his redemptive work, which at that time was redeeming us from Egypt. But it also points forward to the ultimate redeemer, Yehoshua. He says, don't even do any work in your homes. And then he goes from the weekly Shabbat, and he takes the focus to the annual Shabbats. And do you know there's seven annual Shabbats through the year? In addition to the weekly Shabbat, every seventh day, there's seven times annually, three in the spring, one in uh, mid-summer, uh, early summer, and then three in the fall. And we're going to look at those this morning as, as we design them. In the first month, on the 14th day of the month, between sundown and complete darkness, comes Pesach. This is the Hebrew word for Passover, for Adonai. This is the Pesach lamb that it's pointing to. Okay, so the very first thing that we have to understand is, when do we observe this? The 15th day, or the 14th day, between the evening, on the first month of the 14th day. Well, Hashem has told us how to observe His holy days. He has certain witnesses that no matter who you are, where you're at in the world, you can observe in the heavens and on earth. There's three witnesses in the heavens. What are they? Okay. So let's put them up here. We've got the sun. We've got the moon. And we've got the stars. The sun must be at a certain equinox in order for the agriculture, for the barley, to be ripe, right? Coming out of Egypt, see the earth was created in the fall on Rosh Hashanah, on Yom Teruah. This is when he created the earth. So it's a type of new year. But after delivering us from Egypt, he says, I want the time that I delivered you from Egypt to be your new new year for the spiritual Moedim calendar. And that comes in the spring. So the sun has to be at that point where, not like winter where there's a great amount of darkness and a little amount of light, and not like full summer where it's all light, but where there's a perfect balance of darkness and light. That's called the spring equinox. So you look to the sun, then you look to the moon. The moon needs to be in the new moon conjunction. According to the book of Enoch, it's not the, si it's not the sliver that starts the first day, but it is when the first ray of light hits it from around the earth, which to us, it looks totally black. It looks dark. There's two days that the moon is in conjunction that is totally dark. And so you can't tell when that first ray of light is hitting it. That's why it's known as the day that nobody knows the day or the hour. And there's only one holy day that falls on that, and that's Yom Teruah, the day that's projected for Mashiach to come, a day of trumpeting. So this starts the month after the sun is in that perfect balance of light and darkness, then you look to the moon. And when the moon is in conjunction, and then the third witness is the constellations. There's always going to be certain constellations in the month of Aviv. Now, God told us to call it Aviv because Aviv means green in the ear. It's when the barley on the new moon, it is green and about two weeks from being ripe. Because two weeks later on Passover, we are going to harvest it and wave the first fruits, right, of barley. So, very interesting how we look at all three witnesses, and if you look at these uh, three witnesses on earth, the agricultural harvest, we would have the barley starting the year. 
And then we start counting. How many days? 50 days to the next harvest. And what's the next harvest? Barley is what starts Pesach, right? Okay, and this is going to be March, April time. Then you have Shavuot. We count the 50 days of the Omer. And it leads up to the next holy day, which is called Shavuot. Whoops. And it is a wheat harvest. And we'll correlate that with Shavuot. Then you come down here. Now this is springtime. And you come down to where we're at today. And this is early summer. And then you come to the fall. And you've got the fall feast, right? And this is the harvest of the trees and the vines. So if you turn in your Bibles to Deuteronomy 8, it gives you a beautiful list of all God's agriculture. But we're going to see that He calls us specifically three times a year, even though there's seven holy days, He calls us to Jerusalem to present our first fruit offerings before Him three times a year. There's three witnesses on earth. The barley, the wheat, and the grapes. Yeah, the trees and the vines. Now if you're off... In the barley harvest, guess what's going to happen? You're going to be off all year long, and your trees are not going to be producing the fruit, and your grapes are not going to be producing the... Uh, your vines are not going to be producing the grapes in order to present your first fruits in the fall. So this keeps you on track even throughout the year. Trees and vines. Somebody read Deuteronomy 8, verse 8 for me. Land of olive oil and honey. Okay, so it mentioned the wheat and barley, it just swapped them around. Barley comes first, wheat, and then in the trees and the vines, we've got pomegranates, right? Olive oil. Yeah. <clears throat> pomegranates, grapes, figs. What was it? Olives. Olives, that's right. And do you know, when it says honey, it's referring to a certain agricultural harvest. It's referring to the dates. Yeah. So we'll even put the dates in here. So you've got three witnesses on earth. And this is why he calls all men to present themselves three times a year to the Lord. Now what's amazing, these witnesses in the heavens are called celestial bodies, right? And as we say, everything is pointing to something deeper, something symbolic. So what do you think the sun is pointing to? Malachi. Let's put Malachi 4.2 up here. Malachi 4.2 says, the sun of righteousness will arise with healing in his wings. Yes, in his zitzit. So the sun is referring to the light of God's glory. So ultimately it's referring to God, but what does Hebrews say is the exact representation of God's Shekinah glory? Yeshua. So we could say the sun represents the sun of righteousness. He's a witness in the heavens. Now, the moon doesn't have any light of its own. It has to fully face the sun to reflect the light of the sun, right? Who do you think the moon could represent? The bride, us, Israel. You can find that definition in Revelation 12, verse 1, if somebody will find that. Isaac, yes. you said this before, 
the moon does not have its own light, it reflects the light of Yeshua. Exactly. So the moon has to face, now, it has to fully face the sun. If it's slightly turned away, it only partially reflects it. And if it turns its back to it, it's completely in darkness. It's a model for us. And for our wives and husbands. There's so many layers to this. And so we could look at the moon as, go ahead, uh, whoever has Revelation 12, 1, and then go down to verse 5 and read that. Go ahead, Danny. Now a great sign appeared in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, with the moon under her feet, and on her head a garland of twelve stars. A woman. This represents the pure woman, unlike the harlot in Revelation, who is the true bride of Yah, and she's literally standing on what? She's standing on the moon, because God's bride will have his timepiece as the foundation, her foundation. She's standing on the moon because she's observing his holy days. This is why John in Revelation says, this is the patience of the hagios, the perseverance of the hog is the feast keepers, the saints. They've gotten translated as saints, but these are the people that are persevering through the final tribulation and they're keeping the feast. They're considered hagios. And he says, those that keep the commandments of God and have the testimony of who? Yes, sure. They're fully facing the sun of righteousness. They're reflecting Yeshua. They're reflecting Yeshua. Yes, Mark. Yeah, no, I like the, the three elements there because the, she is, has the shining of the sun. Yes. The moon underneath her and the stars and the stars. Yes, so then we'll get to what is the stars? The sun is literally shining through. That's right. Amen. Good point. So see how deep, even, they're not just about do this, don't do that, observe this day, don't observe that day. Look at how he's even timed them so that no matter where you're at, you could look up in the heavens and see where you're at in the year and then correlate these three witnesses with three witnesses on the earth. What's the agriculture doing in Israel? Go ahead and read verse 5 as well. She bore a male child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron. And her child was caught up to God and his throne. So not only does the moon represent the bride that's reflecting the sun of righteousness in the glory of God, but it's through the bride, Israel, that that glory is made manifest in the flesh. She gives birth to the male child. What do the stars represent? We always let the Bible be its own translator, right? We're not speculating. There's many people that speculate about all kinds of things, but it's not Bible-based. The stars, letting Revelation be its own translator, if you look up Revelation 1, um, I think it's verse 20. Yeah, it is 20. Remember, John saw in vision seven menorahs. And those seven menorahs, he says, were the seven assemblies of called out believers in Mashiach. These are the messianic bodies, different types of messianic bodies. Everybody's coming from a different place, right? And he gives different rebukes to each one of them because they're coming out of the paganism of different false religions. Israel has been scattered amongst all the nations. They've lost sight of the one true God and his Torah. They've adopted the pagan practices of the people in which they lived, the nations in which they lived. And so this is why God lovingly rebukes his in time called out believers. He's saying, hey, let go of this stuff, get rid of it. There's only two that don't get a rebuke and that's Smyrna and Philadelphia, brotherly love and complete obedience to, to Torah. But after looking at those seven menorahs and looking, that's why we love the menorah. It's a symbol, you know, we're surrounded by Israel and Judah, but the menorah is that aspect of the testimony of Yeshua is central in, in both houses of Israel. Then he says, the seven stars which you saw are the seven angels. So stars represent the angelic host. Now, throughout the universe, God has three witnesses of a different type of bodies. He has the celestial bodies, but he also has Yeshua as the ultimate testimony of his character, right? He was the greatest reflection of God's selfless love in laying down his life, the greatest revelation of that ever seen. The bride, looking at the son of righteousness and that selfless love that he showed, should reflect that selfless love, right? So a second witness to what? To the Father. All of this is to the Father. And the angelic host are his messengers. 
in Hebrew, we have king, melech. Angel is malach. It's the same three root consonants in Hebrew. Very similar, because a king is a messenger of the Most High. We are given dominion, but we don't own this dominion. I don't really own anything. I'm just a conduit of his love and a steward of all that he's entrusted with me. And that's why he who is faithful with a little will be ruler of much. The king has to reflect Hashem's glory, Hashem's mercy, Hashem's justice, Hashem's kindness, Hashem's grace, all of these things. The bride reflects that revelation in the king, the son of righteousness, the angelic host as well. So we have three different types of witnesses throughout the heavenly bodies. Now when we look back at the holy days, we can look at this with more understanding. He says, at this time of the barley, in verse 9, tell the people of Israel, after you enter the land I'm giving you, and you harvest its ripe crops, you're to bring a sheaf of the first fruits to the Kohen. He's to wave this sheaf, we're talking about barley, before Adonai, so that you will be accepted. On the day that you wave the sheaf, you are to offer a male lamb without defect in its first year as a burnt offering for Adonai. Its grain offering is to be one gallon of fine flour mixed with olive oil and an offering made by fire to Adonai as a fragrant aroma. Its drink offering is to be of wine one quart. You are not to eat bread, dried grain, or fruit until the day that you bring the offering for your God. This is a permanent regulation throughout all your generations no matter where you live. So this would be observed in March to April time. You just have to correlate what the sun, moon, and stars are doing, and the barley. Is the barley green in the ear? Do you know, after so many years, because a lunar cycle is 29 and a half days, after about three years of observing 29 and a half day months, 12 months in a year, that gives the lunar cycle 354 days in a year, which is 10 days off from the sun, right? So you're getting further and further back, 10 days each year. So in three years, you're actually a month off. This is why you correlate it with the barley. Because if the barley's not green in the ear, you know it's time to add a 13th month. That catches the barley up so that it is then green in the ear, and you're ready to then harvest it and wave it before the Lord at Pesach. Verse 15 then goes on to the counting of the Omer. From the day after the day of rest, so this is the weekly Sabbath after Passover, you start counting 50 days. So you would start on the first day of the week, and you would start counting 50 days, and you end on the first day of the week, Shavuot. It says you are to count seven full weeks until the day after the seventh Shabbat. So 49 days, and then the 50th day is Shavuot. You are then to present a new grain offering. And here by the, the, the Bible's own words, it's the day after Shabbat. That 50th day will be after seven complete Sabbaths. You, then you are to present a new grain offering to Adonai. You must bring bread from your homes for waving. So now instead of, like the Pesach, you take the barley in a sheaf and you would wave it at the temple before the Lord. Now, with the wheat, you're grinding it down. You're mixing olive oil with it. There's an exact prescription. And you make, it, there's even an exact um, amount. Remember what that amount is called of wheat? That each loaf would be? An omer. Two loaves made with about a gallon of fine flour, baked with leaven. So these are loaves that rise. In contrast to at Pesach, you're eating bread that's unleavened. So you have a gallon of wheat flour. Imagine how long those loaves are. We did it one year as an example for our congregation. They were about this long and about as wide as the Bible here, you know, and you're waving two loaves like that, huge big loaves. You have to have a special kind of oven even to bake them in. <laughs> This is a first fruits of the wheat. And look at what happened 2,000 years ago. The Spirit of God descended on the same day that God gave the Ten Commandments on this day, Shavuot as well. And there was a first fruits that happened of wheat. Liking to the fall harvest, a lot of times we'd talk about um, God separating the wheat from the tares. 
but there was a wheat harvest. It was a first fruits, uh, first fruits of believers. There was 3,000 people added on this day 2,000 years ago. There's many amazing things that happened because Shavuot means renewal uh, of covenant. So when Noah came out of the ark and he built the altar to the Lord and the rainbow appeared, that was on Shavuot. God renewed his covenant with man. Isaac was the promised child that would be a type of the coming one to give his life. He was born on Shavuot. <laughs> God takes the people of Israel to Sinai to renew his covenant with them as his bride, to betroth them and give them his ketubah, which is the Torah, which is like a marriage covenant. Shavuot was that day. And then 1,500 years later, there's a first fruits of people that come when the Spirit descended upon them. And just like at Sinai, where the people heard voices like thunder and fire come down on Mount Sinai, this is the same model that happened 2,000 years ago with the people hearing every language in their own tongue. And fire, the Spirit descended in flames upon their heads. So you see God working in the same model. The more we understand about each of these holy days, the more significance we will see to the foreshadowing. So we can see all of, and this would be May, June time. Everything to this point has been pointing to that which would happen with Yeshua and just after Yeshua. You know, Yeshua rose on the 40th day. So it was only 10 days after he rose, they saw him rise from the Mount of Olives, that the Spirit descended, that they were observing Shabbat. They were keeping Torah. That's why it says they were all together in one accord, because we're all supposed to come together and be unified on Shavuot in Jerusalem. So we present ourselves at Pesach, at Shavuot, and then in the fall, we have three holy days. They are called Yom Teruah, Yom Kippur, and Sukkot. Let's look uh, down at verse 26. Adonai said to Moshe, I'm sorry. Verse 23, Adonai said to Moshe, tell the people of Israel in the seventh month, now you're in the seventh month, remember this is considered the first month. This is the third month on the Hebrew calendar, and this is going to be the seventh month. Yom Teruah is on the first day, Yom Kippur is on the tenth day, Sukkot is from the 15th day to the 22nd, seven days. He says, In the seventh month, the first of the month, is to be for you a day of complete rest for contemplation. What are we to contemplate? If all of this has been fulfilled in Yeshua's first coming, and Yeshua fulfilled the prophet like unto Moshe, who would be humble and meek, and the suffering servant of Isaiah 53, who would give his life, who would be afflicted with our sins, then we're to contemplate how he is going to return, because he ascended just 10 days before this day, and the angel said, know ye not that he will come back in like manner, that he has uh, gone up? So he will descend above Mount Olives on this day, the day of trumpeting. This is the day that Paul foresaw 1 Thessalonians 4.16 says, The Lord shall descend with a shout, with the voice of the archangel and the trumpet of God. This is the day that Joel said, The day of the Lord will be a day of darkness. Why? Because Yom Teruah is on a new moon. It says, and a day of trumpeting, Joel chapter 2. So you see it both in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And it's all pointing to when this prophet like unto Moshe, who's the suffering servant, comes back to reign as high priest and king. But there's something to happen before he does. His feet don't touch the Mount of Olives on Yom Teruah. He catches up his bride because there has to be a marriage and the marriage supper of the Lamb. This is why he said, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would have told you. What's that place? It's not mansions like we get translated in the English. It's hoopas. 
It's marriage chambers. And traditionally, the marriage chamber was always built off of the father's house. A bridegroom would go and betroth the bride, write out a beautiful covenant of what price he had paid in the dowry for her, what he expected of the bride to remain chaste and pure. And then he says, I'm going to go back to my father's house and prepare the place for the wedding. And I'm going to build this hoopah, this marriage canopy, off of the father's house. Then I'm going to come back and I'll receive you unto myself. And, I, and that day would always be a day of darkness. It would be on a new moon. And it would be sometime after midnight because he would try to surprise her. He would try to catch her asleep. The bride was always supposed to be watching and waiting. And this is what he tells his people. Yes, Steve. And uh, I understand correctly when uh, Yeshua or Jesus was born, he was born in Hoopa. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was during, he was born on Sukkot. It wasn't a hupa, but it was a, a sukkah. Yeah, he was born on the first day of Sukkot because Sukkot represents tabernacling with men. And he tabernacled in human flesh as a man on the first day of Sukkot, which was just a few days ago. That was the true birthday of Yeshua. And he will come back and start his reign on that first day, tabernacling with men once again. But on Yom Teruah, he catches up his bride and then he takes his bride to the hoopah in the heavenly sphere. And because there's two days, you know, nobody knows the day or the hour because the new moon has two dark days. There's two days that you allot for Yom Teruah. Now, if you take from the second day to the ninth, Yom Kippur begins on the Erev, the ninth of Tishri. So you literally have seven days the bride is in the hupa in the heavenly sphere do you know that jews as they prepare for the marriage they have preserved this they always have the bride in the hupa with the bridegroom for seven days before the veil is lifted and this is why even jacob he didn't recognize leah she had that veil on there's seven perfect days, and hoopah comes from the word kafar in Hebrew, which means a veiling, a covering, because God has covered our sins with the blood of the Lamb. He's made atonement for us. What's amazing is, as the bride comes out of the hoopah on Yom Kippur, the veil is lifted. Then you know your beloved, even as you are known. And you see three things happen on Yom Kippur. Traditionally, the year of Jubilee is announced. And judgment is usually happens to those that are wicked on Yom Kippur. Remember, your name is sealed in the Book of Life on Yom Kippur. But if your name's not sealed in the Book of Life, what's happening on the earth during this 15-day period from Yom Teruah to Sukkot? This is what's called the seventh plague, the final indignation, the wrath of God, 100-pound hail, fire, brimstone on this earth. And so you're literally, there's judgment that's occurring simultaneous with the bride's veil being lifted and her seeing her bridegroom, her husband, being coronated as king. You're going to experience this in the heavenly sphere. Then there's five days from the 10th to the 15th that prophetically we will have a marriage supper of the Lamb. Now what's interesting, what a beautiful supper that will be in heaven before the Lord descends with all of his holy ones with him back to the Mount of Olives to rebuild the temple on the first day of Sukkot. But Ezekiel tells us that during that time that there's a marriage supper of the Lamb, there's a supper going on on this earth. Have you heard of what that supper looks like? It says, he will call all the vultures and eagles together to eat the flesh of the kings and captains of all the armies of Armageddon who came against Jerusalem and came against Israel at the day that the Lord descended, Zechariah 14 says, arrayed for battle. You know, there's two things that a trumpet announces. It's not only a wedding, but it's also a war. He comes back right in the midst of the worst war ever to be on the face of this earth. Daniel describes it like this. He says, it'll be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation. And so the trumpet announces a battle cry. He comes back to save his bride, but it also, we blow the shofar before the wedding. So there's multiple layers to this, dual things happening. And it helps us see that just as he was pointing to the spotless Lamb of God who was slain from the foundation of the world in the spring feast, these fall feasts which we're observing now, we should be meditating on what is to come. What are they pointing to? Because he fulfilled every single element of the spring feasts perfectly. 
So how can we think that the fall feasts are insignificant, that he won't fulfill each one of these significantly? That's why we have to become familiar with them and what they mean. Yom Kippur is described in verse 26. It says, Adonai said to Moshe, the tenth day of the seventh month is Yom Kippur. You are to have a holy convocation. You are to deny yourself, and you are to bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. It's interesting, an offering made by fire. And there's going to be, remember that seventh plague, which it's, Revelation says Babylon falls in one hour? Well, one hour, if you take, which is 1 24th of a day, you take a Jewish year and you divide 1 24th, um, a 360-day Jewish year by 1 24th, you get exactly 15 days, which is that period between Yom Teruah and Sukkot that the earth is experiencing 100-pound hail, fire, earthquake. And so this is the judgment that's happening on the earth for those that have rejected God's free gift. He says, you're not to do any kind of work on that day because it is Yom Kippur, to make atonement for you before Adonai, your God. In the Hebrew, it calls Yom Kippur a Shabbat Shabbaton as well. It's a day of complete rest. Anyone who does not deny himself and afflict his soul is to be cut off from his people. And anyone who does any kind of work on that day will be destroyed. You are not to do any kind of work. It is a permanent regulation throughout all your generations. So that does away with the argument that, oh, these were things of the past. That was for Israel thousands of years ago. This isn't relevant for us today. He says it's a perpetual statute for all generations. No matter, then he further has a caveat, it doesn't even matter where you live. So he's basically telling the lost house of Israel dispersed amongst all the nations, you're going to be other places. But... In other generations, it doesn't matter where you live or what generation you're at. It will be for you, if you want to be part of my covenant people, a Shabbat of complete rest, a Shabbat Shabbaton. You are to deny yourself. You are to rest on your Shabbat from evening on the ninth day through the tenth day to evening. It is a day of public assembly. That was last Shabbat it happened to fall on. And we had that public assembly. It was an all-day fast. And what a blessed time it was. There was so much depth to that. And I tried to reveal to you last week the different segments of the temple service that has now been become a part of our synagogue um, Yom Kippur. They still break down into those five sections what they did in the temple during the Yom Kippur. The only difference is instead of sacrifice, we're offering uh, prayers and liturgy and studies and retelling the story of what the priest did on that day. Now in verse 33, we come to Sukkot. Adonai said to Moshe, tell the people of Israel, on the 15th day of this seventh month is the feast of Sukkot. Sukkot is a temporary dwelling. It's to remind us that we're only here temporarily, both in this land and in this body. We are t temporarily dwelling, just like the children of Israel lived in temporary dwellings called booths um, from the time that they left Egypt, 40 years through the wilderness, they were in temporary dwellings called sukkahs. This is why we build a sukkah, to remember that these 7,000 years, they're just temporary. We're going to live eternally with God. This exile that we're in as the children of Israel in a foreign land, in America, God's used America to protect us in essence, but we're not, this isn't our destiny to stay here. It's a temporary dwelling. And even our bodies that house the Spirit of God, we have to remember it's a temporary dwelling. So there's so many different elements. And even Yeshua, he recognized his spiritual identity, didn't he? Because he, like Paul, did, died daily to the point where the body was nothing to be held on to. And that's the way we should be if you're ever faced with persecution and many people want to protect themselves. We have to trust God, be a witness. The body is fleeting. It's a temporary vessel. The spirit is what's eternal. And that's what we're working to feed and to build up and to strengthen. And so this very first day of Sukkot was pointing forward to the word made flesh. And that he would tabernacle in a temporary human dwelling. And it says on the first day there is to be a holy convocation. This is Yehoshua's birthday. Did you know that? Right here. Now, remember Yochanan, the immerser, John? He was born six months before Yeshua, right? So what is exactly 15, 
I mean, six months before Sukkot. You come back here to Pesach. Pesach is on the 14th, right? The first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which we call Matzah. It leads right into Matzah. And that's on the 15th day. And it goes from the 15th to the 22nd. It mirrors. And this is the day that John was born, the 15th. And it's a holy day also. <laughs> so both John and Yeshua have a week-long <laughs> festival surrounding their birthdays. When we look at the eighth day, like we talked about this morning, the eighth day assembly, imagine Yeshua being born on the 15th day of the seventh month, the holy day of Sukkot, and then they start counting eight days to the time when he's going to be circumcised, right? His circumcision landed on the eighth day assembly, the day in which all of us as the nation of Israel rejoice in the Torah. We're literally rejoicing in the Torah made flesh on the eighth day assembly. That's why the, remember the older lady and the older man at the temple when they came to present him, they said, we have longed to see the coming Messiah. This is beautiful. God even had this day foreshadowed. May we, after his example, circumcise our hearts and our flesh so that we can be sensitive to living out in purity God's Torah. He says, on the first day there's to be a holy convocation. Don't do any kind of work. On the eighth day, you're to have another holy convocation. That's going to be this coming Friday. Bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. It is a day of public assembly. Do not do any kind of ordinary work. This is a day of rejoicing. Traditionally, we take out the Torah scroll from the ark and we parade it around and we rejoice truly in the Torah being written upon our heart and the annual Torah cycle being completed. Verse 37 says, then sums it up. These are the designated Moedim, the appointed times of Adonai, that you are to proclaim as holy convocations and bring an offering made by fire to Adonai. So I hope that this little quick summary of these holy days, both spring, early summer, and fall, and their prophetic fulfillment blesses you as you meditate, as we're leading up to the great eighth day, Shemini Atzeret in the Hebrew, Simchat Torah, rejoicing in the Torah, the eighth day assembly. Everything points to the Word made flesh. Is that the this, only eighth day? Eight days of a feast or a celebration. Yes. That alone should point and let us all see. It's that significant. That have to be the last. That's right. Because happened. matzah has seven days. Yeah. Sukkot has seven days. There's only one time that you experience the eighth day, and it represents eternity after the seventh millennium. Yeah. Just as the seven days of Sukkot look forward to the seventh millennial day. The eighth day assembly looks forward to the eighth millennium. This is after the millennial reign where sin and death are now no more. Remember at the end of the millennium, Revelation says, the dragon, the beast, and the false prophet are thrown into the lake of fire along with sin and death. So this is representing a perfect world where Torah is fully written upon our hearts and where we're fully living out God's character of selfless love. On this day that symbolizes that day, that millennial day, remember Peter says a day is like a thousand years to the Lord. So each day of creation not only has a hidden prophecy in it pertaining to each thousand year millennium throughout history, which if you can be here next week, we're going to go into Genesis 1-1 and I'm going to show you hidden prophecies within the creation week. The seventh day, Sabbath, always points forward to the millennial Sabbath. The eighth day points forward to eternity, where the Torah of God is forever written upon our hearts. Seven days you shall offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord. On the eighth day shall be a holy convocation unto you, and you shall offer an offering made by fire to the Lord. It is a solemn assembly, and you shall do no work thereon. These are feasts of the Lord, which you shall proclaim to be holy convocations. So, we have the first day and the eighth day, unlike Passover, it's the first day and the seventh day of the week-long uh, Hag Matzah, the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that are the holy days. So it's going to be Friday that is the holy day, because it's actually the eighth day, not the seventh day of uh, Tabernacles, but the eighth day that he's saying no work shall be done on it. This is a foreshadowing of having our hearts transformed and symbolically circumcised in sensitivity to divine love. This is what circumcision means on the eighth day. 
it's representing taking away that hardened heart and having skin like baby skin, having a sensitivity to God and to his word and to wanting to hunger and thirst for righteousness and to do all of his mitzvot. Leviticus 12, 3 says, And in the eighth day, the flesh of his foreskin shall be circumcised. So even the circumcision, this covenant with Abraham, this is what it's pointing to. Eternity, where we naturally want to live out the Torah. And we know how to do it because it's been written on our hearts for the thousand years preceding. And for those of us that have the blessing of studying Torah together, it's wonderful to even prepare to be priests and kings in the kingdoms because what did Yeshua say? You will reign with me for a thousand years. So those that are prepared as a bride without spot or blemish, who are writing Torah upon their hearts in these days, you'll be prepared to be priests and kings in his millennial kingdom and teach the nations. Deuteronomy 10, 16 says, Circumcise, therefore, the foreskin of your heart, and be no more stiff-necked. This is what it's all about. We want to be so gentle, so sensitive, so kind, that even the smallest area of, that, of sin in the life, which sin is actually Torahlessness. 1 John 3, 4 says, Sin is the transgression of the Torah. So any way that we are transgressing the Torah, it's separating us. Isaiah 59, 2 says, your sins have made a separation between you and your God. So it's living out of harmony with the selfless love that's seen in Torah that separates us from God. And we want to be so sensitive that if there's any small little iota in our life that is creating a separation between us and our God, that we willingly give it up, that we run back into the Father's arms. We want to have a circumcised heart. Deuteronomy 30, verse 6 says, And Adonai, your God, will circumcise your heart, and the heart of thy seed, this is your children. What's the whole purpose? To love the Lord your God with all of your heart and with all of your soul, that you might live. This is what Yeshua was talking about as the living Torah coming in the flesh, saying, I come to give life and life more abundantly. Ezekiel 36, 26 says, A new heart also I will give you, and a new spirit I will put within you. And I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh, and I'm going to give you a heart of baby skin, in other words. This is beautiful. You know, remember Keith Green? Great singer. He sang this song where, as he was doing his intro, he says, Oh, Lord, all I want to have is baby skin on my heart. And I love that. That's the kind of desire that we should all have. Ezekiel 44, 9 says, Thus says the Lord God, No foreigner, uncircumcised in heart and in flesh, of all the foreigners who are among the sons of Israel, shall enter my sanctuary. So it's very important that we prepare, through our Torah study, to have a sensitive heart, to desire teshuva, which is to return to God's ways. If we have a stony heart, a rebellious heart, what do we say? Ah, I don't need to do that. That's not convenient for my life, right? But if you have a sensitive heart, you say, whatever he asks of me, I know it's for my good. And we have this philosophy in Judaism that no matter what happens, no matter how big the obstacle or trial or tribulation, we say, gamzu le tova, it's for my good. We recognize that's how close we are to the Father, that we recognize whatever comes our way, it's an opportunity for character development and for purification through the refiner's fire. And we say, it's for my good. We remind ourselves. And that way we stay positive no matter what we go through. Jeremiah 31, 31, the place that people claim the new covenant, right? How many times have you heard, I don't need the law. I don't want to study Torah. I'm not under the law. The law was nailed to the cross. I'm under the new covenant, right? You've heard this term. But do you know that the new covenant is actually having the Torah written upon your heart? It's not doing away with the Torah. It's embracing the Torah. And here's the text that people refer to without ever really thinking about what it means. Behold, the days come, says Adonai, that I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel. So this is the first thing. If you want to be part of the new covenant, be grafted into Israel and with the house of Judah. 
This shall be the covenant that I make with the house of Israel. After those days, so he's speaking of the last days, I will put my Torah in their inward parts. This is what the new covenant means. It's not doing away with Torah. It's writing it in our inward parts and writing it on our hearts. And he says, and I will be their God. So part and parcel of him being our God is us being grafted into Israel and us allowing God to write his instruction. Torah in Hebrew is, it doesn't mean rules and restrictions like law does. It means instruction. It's like instructions from a loving father in how to live a blessed life, how to live a life more abundantly, how to live a healthy life. He says he wants to write that in our inward parts and in our hearts so that we live it out naturally. And they shall no more teach each man his neighbor and every man his brother, saying, No, the Lord, for they shall all know me in that day, from the least of them to the greatest of them, says Adonai, for I will forgive their iniquity. That means he's going to forgive our Torahlessness. Has any one of us lived out Torah perfectly? Nope. No. No. We are saved by grace through faith. But when we realize the love of God in saving us, what does that do to the heart? It woos us into wanting to obey, to trusting him that his instructions are for our good. And this is the difference. This is where people put the cart before the horse. They think we're trying to work out our righteousness or our salvation through our works and that's the furthest thing from the truth exactly. Yeshua says if you love me you will keep my commandments once you realize how good God is you fall in love with him and you can't wait to do everything that he's asked of you because you know it's for blessings it's for prosperity it's for health it's for wellness he says and I will remember their sins no more and of course John looked forward to this day this eighth day and he says I saw a new heaven and a new earth and the former things were done away with and the new Jerusalem came down out of heaven. This is a beautiful depiction because it says the new Jerusalem is adorned as a bride. So right now we're preparing ourselves as a bride without spot or blemish for who? For Mashiach, right? So we're right now acting as a body in the feminine and we're waiting for the bridegroom. When we become one with the bridegroom, and then he teaches us Torah for a thousand years, all of a sudden, we become, as you become one with the bridegroom, you become a part of that bridegroom, and then the new Jerusalem is descending as a bride. There's another type of marriage after the millennial reign. And this is the at one that the Yom Kippur represents, where God is actually able to have intimacy with us, where there's no more darkness, because darkness can't coexist with light. And he's been desiring to draw us near to him in purity so that he can have the true intimacy that he created us for. That's why he created us in his image. So this is all beautifully, not only depicting the holy days, but the plan of salvation and the marriage uh, of not only the lamb, but also the marriage of the father. Revelation 21, 1 through 5 says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth. The first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. That's us in Yeshua. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is now with men. Up to this point, it's been in heaven. But after that point, the earth is going to be the center of all cosmic worship. For whatever other creations God has created, even the angelic host, they're going to have to come to earth to present themselves. Remember in Job, the sons of God came before the Lord to present themselves, each one giving an account of the dominion that they were entrusted with. The earth is going to be the place where the sons of God come and present themselves before the Lord through for eternity. And they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. And there shall be no more death, neither sorrow, no more crying, neither shall there be any more pain. For the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And that's what he's doing for us today. He's making us new creatures. Praise God. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. So as you meditate this on this eighth day assembly we can know the deep significance and symbolism hidden within this looking forward to living eternally with our god at one Yeah.
are but shadows of things to come displaying the victory that you have won you have won we will obey for we love your name lion of judah the lamb that was slain yahweh your one father and son aleph and tov to you we shall Our Savior, he rested on the seventh day. From his Sabbaths, we will not stray. Creator Yahweh, Lord of Shabbat, from your holy day, depart we shall not. Yeshua's returning on the seventh day, so pour out your spirit on all who obey. We will obey. We will obey for we love your name, Lion of Judah. The Your eternal law is on our